Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Vowels and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in tube lab number 177. That's got to mean something, doesn't it? I guess it doesn't. Not till we get to <laughs> 200. Anyways, we're getting close. We're getting close. Well, closer. We're going to talk about signal path purity and most exciting, a new kit is born. We'll talk about that after we do the, the show on the signal path. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. If you follow Tube Lab and our other channel, Melatone Kits, you're almost certainly interested in vacuum tubes. And most likely, you're also trying to achieve the best sound possible in your home system. Now, the audio signal starts in the studio with microphones and pickups, is patched to a mixing board, recorded, mastered, and eventually produced as a finished audio product for us to consume. Now, we don't have any say in that process other than to choose to spend our money on high quality audio. You can really tell when um, they've taken care with the mastering and the production of audio. Yeah, and it doesn't have to cost a lot of money. I mean, we go thrifting. Uh, <laughs> we do. Yeah, we do. And we have a great time because we just never know what we're going to find. We, we will find a record that neither one of us knows anything about. We'll haul it home. It take a chance on it. Take a chance. Take a chance on me. <laughs> and uh, most of the time, it goes back to a thrift store. But often, we find something fabulous yeah yeah it surprises us yeah and it's just such a small amount of money it's just fun to do okay so yeah so we do have a choice uh in what happens from our source to our speakers and that can make a huge difference in how something is going to sound so if you're trying to improve your sound the first thing you should do is sketch out the signal path now, unfortunately, you won't be able to sketch the entire path because most equipment manufacturers don't publish schematics. But if you own our gear, we publish a full set of schematics for every kit we sell. So in that case, you could actually make a complete circuit sketch from beginning to end. Okay, so now the reason you want to do this is to try and figure out if you have a weak link in the signal chain and, of course, try and improve it. I'm always amazed when either Charles or I suggest an improvement in our own system. In most cases, we can immediately hear the difference, and there's no going back once you hear the improvement. Okay, now I've made a sketch. It's a very generic sketch, so if I've missed something, if your favorite recorded medium is not on here, if you like to listen to vintage wax cylinders... <laughs> or Betamax. Or, or Betamax. <laughs> Yeah, actually, I had, uh, years and years ago, I had um, a spiral recording VHS um, uh, high-quality uh, mastering uh, recorder. Yeah. Uh, can you believe that you used to be able to record audio onto video formats like that? Yeah, but it didn't record the audio linearly. It recorded it in a sort of a spiral uh, following of the tape. It was just totally bizarre but i got 96 db of uh, signal to noise ratio on that wow. <laughs> yeah yeah so anyways uh yeah so no comments please if we miss something that is your pet pet uh source but basically most of us are going to be listening to vinyl to tape to cds dvds blu-rays sacds and the vast majority of you are probably listening to some digital source you're going to have to cable up your source somehow. You're going to come into a DAC or a phono preamp or a head preamp in the case of high quality tape. And from there, you got to cable up and you may come into a step attenuator and that we're going to look at a step attenuator in just a minute. You got to cable that up. You're going to come into a control preamp. Again, you're going to cable up and you're going to land in a pair of mono blocks and into a pair of speakers more or headphones or headphones more yeah. cabling and now you could have 
almost all of this in one box. And in fact, back in the day, that's the way it was done. Yep, and that's one of the reasons why we aren't the biggest fan of fully integrated systems is because it gives you very little control over everything that's going on in here. Yeah, and when I was a young uh, audiophile, many, many, <laughs> many decades ago, I won't tell you how many, um, I was lucky because FM radio had taken off at that point and was... It was, it hadn't quite taken over AM radio yet. I started on AM <laughs> and my God, what a joy when we got stereo and uh, FM took over. And, um, and I was around, of course, on the first night of the first uh, presentation of the very first CD player. I can remember, you know, holding my breath, waiting for that perfect <laughs> sound, not. So I've been around. And uh, I started, I grew up with, a, with my father's system, which was a complete system that was a tube-based system, and it sounded, it actually sounded amazing. Um, but as a young audiophile, we, we, we went the separate route. That's by the time the 70s had arrived, everybody was doing separates. And that gives you a lot of flexibility. So you may, if you're just, if you started out or you're on a really tight budget, you might have a DAC that is combined with your control preamp and then you have an integrated amp and then you're in the speakers and that's fine. Uh, but your, so your, your signal chain drawing will be a lot simpler than this. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, in our system, we have almost all of this in our system. It has separate discrete components. The one thing that we don't have yet, but that's on the sketch on the drawing board, is a head preamp for um, our reel-to-reel -reel decks. But that might come at some point in the future. Yeah, in fact, you're going to talk about a tube that was designed for that very use. Yeah, a little interesting one. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that'll come anyways. So the important thing, though, is to sketch it out. Don't ignore the cabling in between equipment. That can make a huge difference. In fact, as a... Uh, as a as a as a budget audio file, I had always thought I could kind of get away with whatever cabling I could find or cobble together. And when I started going to higher quality cable, I was amazed at all of the things that improved. I, I was pessimistic about it at first, I will admit. But hearing the difference in better quality cables compared to poorer quality ones, uh, it's, you know, it's night and day. It's surprising how much of a difference it makes. In our own system, the latest thing that we've done is that I, I built a whole series of prototype cables that I designed and built from scratch. I chose the cabling. I chose the connectors, I chose how to assemble them, and I built the prototypes with the idea that if I could build a decent sounding cable, that we would have maybe eventually a kit cable uh, um, uh, product available in the store. And wow, the improvement over high quality cables that we had paid good money for was amazing. And all it came down to was focusing on one particular thing, which was low resistance. Low resistance, yeah. I mean, we wanted to keep the capacitance as low as possible as well, but lower resistance really helped. Yeah. So you'll hear more about the cables, but essentially we took our design philosophy for how we design our kits and we applied it to how we designed and built the cables. And... Uh, it held true. Of course it did, because the kits sound amazing as well. Okay, so let's just have a quick look at the, the newest kit. So here is our stepped attenuator kit, and I actually had called it a kit amp, and Charles said, no, wait a minute, it's, it's not actually an amp. There's no active electronics in here at all. It's entirely passive. Yeah, and that's probably one of the secrets to this. Now, there's a lot of ways you can control your volume, and... Uh, some of them are going to be less intrusive to the signal and some of them will be more. In this case, this is about as minimalist as you can get. Now, if you're interested in knowing how the, how the circuit works and the secrets of why it sounds so good, there's going to be um, uh, uh, an introductory video 
over on our other channel. Yep, it's the first video in the build series for this guy, and yeah. it'll explain everything about how it works and why it works so well. Yeah, so it's over on uh, Melatone Kits, and we'll put a link below this video, like we always do, and you'll be able to pop over, and you can watch the introductory video in which I actually go over the design and um, and talk about various uh, volume pots and, and how they work in circuit. But for now, we just get to hear the satisfying clicks because yeah. this is a 24-stepped attenuator. Essentially just a rotary switch, a two-pole rotary switch. With lots of contacts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's... And 2P24 throw, yeah. Something like that, yeah. Anyways, um, and I, I'll just give you a quick peek inside. I've taken the bottom off, and oh, I wanted to actually show off our newest finish, and that's going to be in the video. I really like this finish. A, um, a viewer who's been a great supporter of our channel, you know who you are, um, introduced me to a product called Odie's Oil, and I combined that with one of my favorite other oils and that creates this beautiful finish a natural finish on black cherry so um so that's a, a good option i mean we're sure we're trying to create um the best sounding audio gear that you can possibly build yourself but we also want it to look good too. oh yeah so that's all there is to it there's 24 pairs of resistors and um a pair of inputs on a double pole, double throw switch, and a pair of output RCAs that are in parallel. And a ground plate here, you can see where it straps up. And that's the whole thing. And you know, you might say, Jim, that's not big enough, it's not sexy enough, it doesn't have it doesn't have tubes. And I'm gonna say the very best sound quality you can achieve at home will be the in in almost every case will be the simplest shortest signal path you can come up with the, the more complication you add to it the more chances are that something will go wrong that noise is introduced that there's something strange happening in the system and phase coherence mm -hmm. which is rarely talked about by anybody but if you split the signal and you use the balanced in and out well there's a very good chance that you've messed up the phase and these changes are not huge. They can be if it's a real F up, but <laughs> <laughs> am I allowed to say that? Is the sensor on YouTube going to bleep us? No, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, in most cases, what we're talking about is very subtle differences. And if you, what happens in audio with the signal chain, we were just looking at the signal chain. You saw how long it could get. If you make a little tiny mistake somewhere, your equipment manufacturer, designer, cable manufacturer, uh, if you build it yourself, and you make a mistake here, there, there, and there, what happens with the signal chain is it's a cumulative. You never get to forget something that was done in the recording studio. That goes all the way to the end to your speakers. And it's possible that at the mixing and mastering stage, they will have corrected it, but if they didn't, mm -hmm. or they tried to mask it and they weren't entirely successful, then that you're gonna to get that, to listen to that. That's the best you're going to get out of it, assuming your system's perfect. And the same thing happens at home. So any little problems in the system become accumulative. So our job as designers of gear is to try to minimize that to the absolute minimum. And at that point, we have a pure signal path. And one last thing, uh, it's time to call for test builders. Now, um, normally we would give uh, a quality set of, of matched free tubes. But where would you put them? <laughs> where would you put them? Yeah. So what we'll do is um, if you're interested in being a test builder, just drop us a note and we'll give you a 10% discount code. Mm -hmm. And there's only going to be room for a handful of test builders because it's a relatively simple kit. And of course, I've already built two of these things. And um, but it should be fun, and it would be. It it's always useful to have test builders because there's always something test builders help us out with the with the kit with the 
with the design and those little tweaks and suggestions we incorporate into future kits. Yeah, it really makes a big difference for us. The biggest thing they do is to check to make sure we've got all the right parts. <laughs> so we've already pulled, what, 10 kits worth? Yeah. In parts. We did that yesterday, I think. And even after double checking, we still somehow always miss something. We so. always do. Yeah. So anyway, so if you're interested in being a test builder, send me a note. I'll send you a code and there'll be the kits will actually be in the store and available to test builders first. And then once the test builders give the feedback, then the general public can go ahead and order theirs. Now, one quick note, these are not simple kits. Yes, they, they look simple. They have quite a, f the, there's not a lot of moving parts in, in the kit, but the soldering skills required to do a good job are a little bit more advanced. That's right. So to, before you build one of these, you will have to have built one of our other kits or some other audio project in which you have to have a reasonably high level of soldering if, skills. If you're comfortable with soldering, then it should be fine. Yeah. Well, Charles, you've got some tubes to talk about. Okay, well, let's clear the deck. Okay, so as usual, we have tons of tubes in the mail on the way. Um, we've been getting lots of great stuff lately, and here's a small sample of some of the tubes that we've been getting in. Now, the um, the rebase Loctals have been selling extremely well. Uh, we've been getting lots of great feedback on them. We're trying to get more in, and here's a couple that we just recently got in. These beautiful tall boy 7N7s are just, they're incredibly difficult to find and they are some of the best sounding 6SN7 tubes that you're ever going to get. And they predate, believe it or not, the Sylvania Bad Boys. Yep, these are equivalent to the very first version 6SN7 WGT, or GTW I think it was also called. First made in the late 30s and uh, in probably as far as what, 1945 maybe? Uh, maybe as late as that. I think most of them are in the late 30s and this is what they end up looking like after we've rebased them and look at how beautiful and tall that tube is with that gigantic chrome dome. It doesn't get much better than that. And so we're always trying to find these guys. They uh, are rare, they're expensive, there's a lot of losses in rebase. Unfortunately, too. yeah, these pins are actually very difficult to solder on the early tubes. They used um, some sort of alloy that is not easy to get a good join on, so that's always a struggle for us. Over here, we've got something sort of on the opposite end of the spectrum. We have a late version 7F7, which of course is the 6SL7 equivalent. So this is the angle plate and with the light chrome on the top. The earlier tubes had a more of a full chrome dome. And this is a beautiful Sylvania example. You tend to find this them like this if they were bulk packed. And we were lucky enough to find some before that we've since run out of. And we've been able to find some more of them now. And they end up looking like this after they've been rebased into essentially a 6SL7. And these, they, they are amazing sounding tubes. Yeah, we love Sylvania tubes. They, they didn't make a bad tube as far as I know in terms of sound quality. And uh, these have been great in our Phono sets, in our Wilsonton sets. Uh, people are loving them. I think that one of the biggest um, uh, things that uh, hasn't been fair historically to tube manufacturers is people piled on to Mullard as being one of the greatest tube manufacturers, and they were, though they also had a reputation for producing some of the noisiest tubes ever made. In fact, I remember reading a note from a UK repairman saying back in the day, uh, when we had to go into the depot and pick up replacement tubes, we would try to get anything but a mullard. <laughs> uh, so uh, just because they just, the, 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 they had a, you know, a basic thing about uh, their noise floor was just always higher than something like a Brymar or, or a, um, a GEC. And, um, you know, other tubes like Telefunken deservedly are, have a great reputation and Phillips tubes as well. Tungsol. Tungsol, yep. yeah. But Siemens just got forgotten for some reason. And uh, did, what did I say? Did I, I say, see, did <laughs> I Siemens? say Siemens? <laughs> <laughs> I think you meant to say Sylvania. Yeah. yeah, well, and, you know, Sylvania made some of the absolutely the best sounding um, octal and nine, miniature nine pin tubes ever made. Yep. 
they don't always hit it out of the park, but of course neither did Mullard and Telefunken and mm -hmm. everybody else. I mean, Philips eventually bought them and Philips had a habit of buying up good two manufacturers around the world. So that tells you something right there. I think Philips first major acquisition was Mullard yep. way back in the late 1930s. So yeah, so they had a long, long relationship with Mullard, mm -hmm. and um, and a, quite a long one with Sylvania. Even though they purchased them later on, they had a habit of having business relationships. Oh, they were working with them for decades before that. Yeah. yeah. All right. So what else do we have here? So we were talking about signal chain and signal pass and keeping them simple earlier, and this is something that RCA came up with to help with that in response to uh, tape decks. So for those that don't know, the signal that comes off of the, the read head on a tape deck is incredibly low. It's lower than a phono pickup. It's lower than a guitar pickup. How many millivolts is it? It's I, I believe it's slightly lower than even a moving coil cartridge. I forget, it's, it's very, very low. So that's problematic if you're trying to stop noise from getting onto your signal chain. And so RCA came up with this guy right here, and this is the 5879 preamp tube. Let's get it out here and take a look. And these were designed specifically for a first stage amplify of a, a tape pickup because you want to get that very low signal up to something that's a little more, more manageable, a little bit more above a noise floor. And if you have any of the RCA technical manuals, they should show a preamp design designed to take this tube. And the incoming signal is shielded, the outgoing is shielded. All the components on the inside have this beautiful big shield around it on here. They were extremely careful about introducing noise. Yeah, so the idea was you'd get the, the signal off of the playback head of, of your tape recorder as soon as possible into a first stage. And in that first stage, um, you deal with it in a, in a very careful manner. You get, it, get the voltage up to a much more reasonable level. And it doesn't have to be that much. I, I think this actually has a fairly low amplification factor. That's right. But it gets you to a point where you're relatively safe. And now you go into your gain and your EQ stages. It's very much like a phono preamp functions, but this would be sort of like a, a pre preamp to the, to a phono preamp. Mm -hmm. And that's typical. I mean, a moving coil cartridge in a vinyl system gets boosted before it normally goes into what would be a regular, uh, phono preamp. So yeah, look at that. Isn't that now, I know it's a miniature nine pin tube, but I think it's kind of sexy. I really like the shield. Anyways, we'll be working with that in a prototype, prototype design at some point. I know a lot of you probably aren't interested in tape, but for anyone who's into analog, it's probably the very best source uh, playback system you can ever have in your system. Um, interestingly enough, a really good vinyl system comes fairly close to a high-end tape system. But of course, the source for a vinyl, vinyl, a vinyl recording is tape. Is tape? <laughs> yeah. It's almost like you're cutting out the middleman. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least in our in our library, our music library is quite large, and I would say what 99% of our vinyl is all was all sourced from tape masters. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for doing that, Charles. If you stay this long, there's some discount codes to help you out. And there's a, a code that is fairly easy to figure out. Somebody got it uh, two weeks ago, I think, and cost us some money. And actually, what was it three weeks ago? We got slammed. We were just absolutely slammed. We had so many orders. I think we worked right through Sunday to keep up. And people were grabbing codes left, right, and center and costing us some serious money. And we always love to see viewers and returning customers taking a discount. Yep. We can reach almost everybody around the world with flat rate shipping of $20. And if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on us, folks. Take care, everyone. This is Jim. And Charles. Signing off. Cheers, everyone.